think a lot of colored people find themselves in this situation where um, what we're too light to be black and too dark to be white, you know. Um, um, are you Italian? Are you Mexican? And when you actually say, no, I'm colored, it, it just shatters there. They, they can't comprehend because to be colored, um, it, it, just, it just confuses people when, when you kind of break the mold of what they, what they perceive a colored person to be. My story starts way back um, to when I was a child at about eight years old. You know, I um, grew up in, an, in, a, in a coloured family. Um, not really aware of apartheid in the apartheid area because of the Groups Areas Act, you had particular groups of people living in, um, in, in areas. My mom was a, a, a very fair skin coloured woman and her, her parents were classified white. My father was a very dark skin coloured man, so my dad would border on coloured black. So obviously the children would be, you know, three of us would be fair skinned with straight hair and three of us would be really dark skinned with um, very different types and textures of hair. But as brothers and sisters, you know, um, love doesn't see um, those differences. And I think my very first experience was a very painful experience because um, my mom had left me um, at my aunt's place who was um, white and lived in a very white life in, a, in, a, in an area that was classified as white and I was welcome there because I had um, a, a skin tone that was acceptable you know and when I'd go there I would be told that you know you're Italian or you're you know this is and you don't live in Mitchell's Plain you live in Autry you know so so my identity um, was really under attack from a very young age but I think the, the real um, the real defining moment for me was one day when my dad um, dropped me off after he had to go to a meeting and my aunt closed the door and turned around and said to her husband, this kaffir. And the word kaffir, by her tone, I could tell was not a good word. You know, um, she thought there was something wrong with my father. And it really bothered me because then she engaged in a conversation. And as an eight-year-old, you don't understand these things, you know. The response afterwards was, was incredible because a lot of my, um, my, my, my black friends and white friends um, couldn't relate to how apartheid actually affected coloured people. You know, for coloured people it was just like um, if, if the whites are doing well you're white, if blacks are doing well you're black. You know, we kind of like, and, and, and all those things that they said about colours, colours that you're spineless, that you're not a people. Coloured people have no backbone. It's not true. We have backbone, you know. We were unfortunately put in a situation where um, we had to choose and, and no one should have to choose. Um, no one should ever have to choose as to whether I take my son or my daughter with me based on the colour of their skin. So conversation did start quite a bit and I really welcomed it. Um, to be able to, to share my story and, and lots of other stories came out of it. I mean, incredible stories of how Someone had not seen the sister for 30, 40 years because when she got married, uh, her mother said it would be best for her to move to the then um, white areas and never to contact them again because she'd have a better life. And to this day, I mean, we're talking 30, 40 years later, she's never seen her sister. Um, so what it did in families, it, dis it destroyed families, it really did. I think it affirms our humanity when we tell stories. I think when, we, when we're sharing stories and acknowledging pain, because we've, we've lost the art of storytelling. In fact, we live in a world where your story doesn't matter. A lot of today, I mean, I think especially this generation, the, even my daughter who's colored, um, and, and even in, in, in with black children, so it's not only white, you'd say, oh, get over it, you know, apartheid was, you know, why do we have to deal with apartheid and all the issues that you guys had with apartheid? I think it's important for us to hear the stories and why mom is the way mom is and why um, mom um, affirms people the way she does because our upbringing or all of those things, all of those, our stories shaped us, our environment shaped us. Um, who knows if, if I had a different environment, I'd have been a different person. I mean, I really dreamt of becoming a, a doctor, but the opportunities weren't there to be a doctor, you know. But if we could listen to stories and then acknowledge the pain of what happened, I'm not asking you to feel the pain. I just want you to take the time and listen to my story and, and, and acknowledge my pain. I'm not saying that you need to carry it and now make up for all the years. I want you to hear me and say, understand, you know, and then be intentional 
um, about um, wanting to reconcile with me. Don't go, because um, today many of the, if, if you share your story of, of the apartheid era or what it did in families, it's get over it, you know. I mean, gee was that was 30 years ago, you know, we we're out of it close to 30 years ago. Um, but those things shaped us and made us the people that we are. What's your story? Telling our stories actually connects us um, with the, the humanity part of that person and says, I'm a person and I value you when I listen to your story. And, and, and not to just pretend to listen to my story, I want you to listen to my story. Because if you're pretending to listen to my story just for the sake of what's your story, and you just honor me as a person, then really don't listen to my story because you do more damage to me, you devalue me even more. My name is Renee Moses. This is my story. What's your story?